His real hero, Nevin, who is really Tolstoy, of course, is watching peasants go to work. And the image he creates, which is a very real image, since I, 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 I did not have to read Tolstoy to get that image, I got it from my mother when she lived in Russia and lived amidst the peasantry. So, gives you an image of Sasha and Sergei, come, we have to do this and do that, have a drink of vodka, and so on and so on and so forth. And people are singing as they are working. And you know, agricultural work, leaving the mining aside, is supposed to be the work that is above all the most onerous type of toil, certainly in a pre-industrial society. But it was done quite frequently, very joyously. You see, and this is the, my direct experience was exactly engaging in gardening, and also in devising a variety of solar structures. You see, I had founded an institute called the Institute for Social Ecology in Vermont, and there. We were teaching students three months out of every year during the summer. And we were constructing alternative technologies. And the joy that entered into the work in which we engaged was extremely exciting and extremely elevating and, 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 and really nourishing for the human spirit. And this was a personal experience. So why do, why do you think work and play became separated? I think work and play became separated because of exploitative purposes and domineering purposes. Uh, going as far back as ancient Egypt, to take a case in point, the building of the great pyramids at Giza, one knows about them, the Khufu pyramid, which is one of the very largest, if not the largest, was actually erected, constructed in great blocks of stone, was pulled by human beings and pulled up ramps, so it is supposed, until these giant pyramids were built. Lewis Mumford calls that the mega machine. The first machine was human labor being placed into coordination with different for other, other workmen. That these giant pyramids were built not simply to honor pharaohs, but in a sense, the ruling class has got a joy out of sitting in the shade and watching these lower human beings perform work that is almost bestial in character, work that in fact today, not only would we, not only today, but even in fairly pre-industrial times, a few centuries back, would have been done by animals. They enjoyed, and this gave them, it enhanced their prestige to feel that they were the observers of other people pulling these huge blocks of stone. It was a form of conspicuous consumption, so to speak. Their, it was their way of showing off their authority by having other people in a condition of subordination pulling these great blocks of stone, which could have been pulled by animals. And so work to begin with became, under hierarchical conditions, a way in which you defined your superior status. If you did not work, if your hands were not calloused, you were a superior human being. In fact, more properly, you were a human being, and they were not. They were subhuman beings. That's one condition. The second con situation that led to work becoming onerous and brutalizing was exploitation, quite obviously. The Industrial Revolution, in particular, uh, reduced people literally to adjuncts of machines, who are to be exploited savagely with no regard to the amount of hours involved. It was usually from early, early hours of the morning. They would begin in the summertime, they would begin to work at as early as four o'clock in the morning and wouldn't finish until sunset, which might be as late as nine o'clock at night. These people hardly, these people were literally worked to death. I did a study of that very carefully, the kind of working hours that people were subjected to. And this was outright exploitation, making profit to compete and reinvest and sort of get ahead in a dog-eat-dog -dog market economy. But do you think that the only criteria for capitalism's exploitation of labor is simply economic? Do you think there are other factors? I think there are psychological factors. I think these psychological factors are still rooted and the image that I tried to give you of the Egyptian rulers who sat and watched in the shade 
and were being fanned by slaves or serfs. Psychological factors in which they felt elevated as a, by the degradation of other people, and specifically by them doing, that is, other people doing onerous work. So I think that there's a psychological factor in that as well. I, I think exploitation is strategic, but I think there are very important psychological factors which I think people have to cope with. And I don't think they have faced these psychological factors involved in, in doing onerous work and doing uh, drudgery. This happens even in the family. Years ago, in the patriarchal family, the men sat and watched women carry the water, as it were, feed the babies, gather the food uh, in a most superior manner. And they sat and they may have smoked a hookah or they may have smoked, they uh, simply relaxed and told tales. And then they went out and they did their manly thing of hunting game and then came back again or they went to war. Uh, war may have very well emerged as a male diversion, <laughs> you see. And they also sat around engaged in creating religions and so forth, you know, telling stories and trying to comprehend the universe. And women did the brute labor of much of early society. And again, there was a sense of superiority, a very important sense of superiority. So this sense of superiority, work is rooted not simply in exploitation. Onerous work is, it has its sources not simply in exploitation. I think it's very important to stress, and I do that in my book, The Ecology of Freedom, I stress the psychological factors involved in giving a sense of hierarchical superiority, not only economic gain, hierarchical superiority to onerous, you know, to freedom from onerous toil, which has to be performed by the majority of people. What do you think are the uh, new visions that social ecology can offer people around the reorganization of work? Very far reaching, I would like to think. For one thing, social ecology would advance the notion that work should be distinguished from toil to begin with. Because what we are really talking about is not, not, not simply work. People must do something. We are constituted by, by biological evolution, like it or not, no matter what deep ecologists tell us to intervene. The question is whether we intervene into the natural world constructively or destructively. Social ecology emphasizes the need to intervene, recognizes the need to intervene constructively as products of nature, That's, which is what I would say human beings are. They are products of nature. But constituted by nature, not simply to graze or to browse or to reproduce or to hunt or to loll in the sun, they also want to do something. They have this enormous impulse largely a product of their intellectual makeup and largely a product of their emotional makeup. They have a very remarkable nervous system. <laughs> one of the things, one of the products of that is the evolution of the brain. The other one is, of course, the ability to use one's fingers and manipulate things. Now, I don't find anything wrong with that, which unfortunately many ecologists seem to think is one of the burdens and cancers that they are suffering from. I think the emphasis that must be placed, and which social ecology does place, is on the ability of human beings to be magnificently creative once their potentialities are given fulfillment. Now, what has that got to do more directly with work? It would mean that we would try to turn our lives into something much more artistic than they are today, to aestheticize experience I don't mean this in the narrow postmodernist sense. I mean it in a much richer sense, a more utopian sense, and a more socially committed sense of aestheticizing the world. So we would try to turn work into a more playful, joyous, and creative experience. They're not all identical terms, but they are a constellation. Play can be frivolous, obviously. Creativity. Well, that is arguable as to what is creative and what is not. But in addition to that, I would like to...